Welcome to Hot Planet Cool Athletes. You are the leaders of tomorrow. Hot Planet Cool Athletes is brought to you in partnership with Protect Our Winters Canada and the University of Waterloo. We'd like to say special thanks to our sponsors who make this program happen. Hey everyone, my name's Angel Collinson and I'm a professional skier. I love the outdoors and so I'm a member of the Protect Our Winners Riders Alliance, which is a community of professional athletes committed to helping solve climate change, which is an issue that affects every single one of us, including you. So we're here today because we know that you can be part of the solution. We're going to share stories about the outdoors and why we're so committed to tackling climate change while providing you with some of the latest climate science, breaking down what we believe is the single most important issue of our generation. Most importantly, we'll let you know how you can make a difference with us. My name is Mike Douglas. I'm a professional skier and filmmaker from Whistler, Canada. I'm also on the board of directors for Protect Our Winters Canada. I want to give you guys a little bit of my background story to see how I ended up talking to you here today. So I was a kid obsessed with skiing and so much so that when I left high school in 1988, I moved straight to Whistler where I started training on the Horseman Glacier, eventually made my way onto the national freestyle ski team and took a good run at the Lillehammer Olympics in Norway. When that didn't exactly go as planned, I turned to coaching and I was coaching in the summers up on the Horseman Glacier at Blackcomb. But in 1997, everything changed. My buddies and I invented twin tip skis and our careers just took off. The next thing you know, we were on TV every week. I was on the cover of ski magazines. I was in all the movies. Everything seemed possible. It was the craziest of times. No matter how crazy of an idea I came up with, it seemed possible. And here's a great example. In 2010, we went to Hawaii and skied on big waves. How absurd is that? So here's a look at the Horseman Glacier at Blackcomb. This is where I learned to ski. This is where I did all my training. And you can see it here. This photo was taken in 2006, and it's the glaciers covered in jumps and all sorts of things. And here's what it looks like today. The ice has melted way back and they even took out the main lift that services that glacier this year. And as I traveled around the world, I noticed that it wasn't just happening in my backyard, it was happening everywhere. This is the Mer de Glace in Chamonix, France, one of the world's most famous glaciers. This picture was taken about 100 years ago and here's what it looks like now from the same viewpoint. So we're in big trouble and I realized, you know what? I'm really not doing anything about it. In fact, I'm part of the problem. All this flying and heli skiing and things that I was doing are causing this problem to increase. So I looked at my own carbon footprint, my own lifestyle, and made some big changes. I stopped heli skiing, I bought an electric car, I recycle and compost, I'm mostly a vegetarian eater. I did all these things in an effort to try and make myself better. Now along the way, I also got into filmmaking. Uh, filmmaking is a huge passion. I love showing the sports that I love in the outdoor world on camera. But in 2016, we made a trip to Greenland that sort of changed my life. We were there on a skiing and climbing mission, but what we did was bring along a climate scientist and we carried out a bunch of experiments on the ice. And that really woke me up to the realities of what's happening to the global climate. And why do I care? Well, it's because of these guys. This is my family. I want my kids to grow up into a world that's just like the world I grew up in with clean water and fresh air and an abundance of snow and a place where winter thrives. And all that led me to join Protect Our Winters because I realized that as an individual, I can only do so much, but as a group, we've got a lot more power. Now I want to introduce you to my partner today. Uh, one of Canada's all-time greatest skiers, Kelsey Sirwa. She is a world champion, an X Games champion, and an Olympic gold and silver medalist. Take it away, Kels. Thanks for the intro, Mike. So I'm Kelsey, and I've competed in ski cross for the last 10 years, and it's provided me with this incredible opportunity to travel the world and represent Canada at the highest level in sport. The sport of ski cross consists of four racers battling head to head, navigating their way down an icy track filled with big jumps, bank turns and rollers. The rules are simple, essentially whoever gets down to the bottom first wins. And what I love most about this sport is that anything can happen during a run. So it's so important to be present in the moment, to be adaptable to the situation and to be persistent in your efforts. 
In this sport, you need to fight all the way to the finish line because you never know what's going to happen. My journey to becoming an Olympic gold medalist began a long time ago when I was just a kid. We spent summers out in the mountains, on the rivers and lakes, fishing and riding our bikes, while winters were spent up on the ski hill at Big White Ski Resort. I've had the incredible opportunity to represent Canada at three Olympic Games. Vancouver 2010 was going to be the first time that ski cross would be featured in the Olympics, yet none of us knew whether it was going to happen. There wasn't any snow anywhere to be found. Coming into February, I remember the stress building as they were building our track literally out of scaffolding and hay bales. What snow was used to cover our course was literally flown in by helicopter or driven in by the truckloads. Anything that didn't need to be covered in snow, cover it with a white tarp. I remember on race day, it was 13 degrees Celsius, and these games were dubbed as the warmest Winter Olympics yet. That record wasn't held for long as 2014 brought another abnormally warm winter season. With average temperatures two degrees warmer than what we experienced in Vancouver, another record was set. Heading into the 2018 Olympic Games as a defending medalist, I realized I had this incredible platform from which I could share the effects of climate change. And that's when I decided to become a Protect Our Winters Canada ambassador. I have literally spent my entire life in the outdoors, enjoying the mountains through winter, summer, all seasons. And if there's one thing that I want to see in this world is for future generations to have that same opportunity. So 99% of scientists agree. It's happening and it's us. But don't take our word for it. Let's hear it from the scientists themselves. Right now, we're going to look at a video from one of my favorite scientists, Dr. Joe Hansen. So let's not beat around the rapidly melting iceberg here. Climate change is happening and we are causing it. The evidence is overwhelming. Scientists usually reserve this level of agreement for claims like Earth is a planet or air is real. Yet here we are. The climate change ship has now left the dock, yet lots of people on shore are still debating whether boats can actually float. But maybe you're a person who trusts and accepts what climate scientists are telling us. It's just sometimes it's hard to explain why. I mean, we've all been there. I mean, I care about the environment. I figure with the polar bears and everything, we might as well try electric cars. What do we have to lose? And then they go caps lock serious, saying they have proof that climate change is a hoax perpetuated by scientists paid off by the polar bear lobby as part of a plan to install Al Gore as Supreme World Polar Bear Emperor. Wake up, sheeple. To keep that from happening, we put together this handy reference. The sun is the source of warmth on Earth, so thanks for that, sun. Ice and clouds reflect some of its light away, but the rest is absorbed by land and water and re-emitted as heat. Some of that heat escapes to space, and some is held in by the atmospheric greenhouse effect. The insulating effect of Earth's greenhouse gases are the reason that life exists as we know it, but human activities have increased the concentration of one of them, carbon dioxide, 40% since the Industrial Revolution. We know the sun's output has varied during history, but since the 1970s, the period when global temperatures increased the fastest, temperature and solar activity have moved in opposite directions. If the sun was to blame, it would cook the upper and lower layers of the atmosphere together. Instead, we only see warming in the lower layers, the same place that human greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide side are piling up. Since 1870, with fossil fuels, cement production, and land use combined, humans have put about 2,000 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere. That's 2 million million tons, and about 40% has stayed there. Studying gases trapped in ice cores has let us see what Earth's atmosphere was like in the past. At more than 400 parts per million, today's carbon dioxide levels are the highest they've been for almost a million years. That's before humans even existed. Totally uncharted territory for us. More carbon dioxide in the atmosphere means average temperatures across the globe are increasing, and fast. Right now, Earth is warming about 10 times faster than at the end of an ice age. Okay, so CO2 is increasing. How do we know it's our fault? The best evidence comes from looking at what isotopes, or different kinds of carbon, are in the atmosphere. Fossil fuels come mainly from old plants. Plants prefer to use the lighter isotope carbon-12 over the heavier carbon-13, so they contain a higher ratio of 12 to 13 than the atmosphere does. When more fossil fuels get burned, the percentage of carbon-12 in the atmosphere should go up, and that's exactly what we see. And it's not because of volcanic activity. Volcanoes only emit about 1% as much CO2 as we do. 
Normally that CO2 is balanced in exchange between the atmosphere, plants, and animals, but eliminating carbon sinks has released centuries worth in just a few years. Other greenhouse gases are also increasing, like methane from farm animals and natural gas processing, or nitrous oxide from fertilizers. If we run simulations just using natural causes of climate change, they predict no change or even cooling in the 20th century, and that is not what's happening. It's still gonna get cold in some places, but in the 2000s, there were twice as many record highs as record lows. And each of the past three decades has been warmer than any other decade since we started measuring in 1850. Since 1900, actual temperatures around the world have increased almost a full degree, and most of that has happened since the 1970s. Looking at data from tree rings and ice cores, the past 30 years is probably the warmest in eight centuries. Of course, not every place on Earth warms equally. Oceans cover more than 70% of Earth, and they absorb more than 90% of the heat added to the planet. Naturally, that's where we see the most extreme changes. Around the world, oceans are rising a tenth of an inch per year, and they're up eight inches since 1901. This is because water expands as it warms. And when ice sheets and glaciers melt in Greenland and Antarctica, water that's normally on frozen land gets put in the ocean. The oceans are Earth's largest carbon sink, as more CO2 enters the atmosphere, more of it dissolves in the ocean, which makes the water more acidic. This doesn't mean the oceans will be made of acid, but animals with calcium shells are super sensitive to pH. We're on course for the oceans to hit pH 7.8 in 100 years, which could wipe out one third of species in the ocean. We also know that levels of summer sea ice in the Arctic have decreased 40% since 1978. They might be the lowest levels in 1400 years. That white sea ice usually reflects the sun's energy back into the atmosphere, but the dark ocean is soaking it up like a black shirt on a sunny day, which feeds the cycle forward. If CO2 emissions continue on their current trends, Earth is on course to be two and a half to five degrees warmer. The oceans could be up to a meter higher by the end of this century. Is that a big deal? Yeah, it's the biggest deal. This is by far the greatest issue facing our species. The last time the Earth averaged a few degrees colder, most of North America was covered in a mile thick sheet of ice. That many degrees warmer? We're gonna have a bad time. So now you're armed with the facts, why we know climate change is happening and why we're causing it. Please share this information with the people you know. All right, Kels, pop quiz. What percentage of Canadians do you think believe in human-caused climate change? Well, Mike, I feel like the majority of my friends do, but I definitely know of some non-believers. So let's say between 75 and 80 percent. Pretty close. 85 percent. So it's even better than you thought, which is, which is pretty good. And what percentage of Canadians do you think are concerned about climate change? Well, if 85 percent believe in it, I'd hope that that same percentage is also concerned about its effects. So I'd say about the same, 85. Yeah, it's actually 83, so just slightly lower. But the good thing is, we don't have to waste a lot of time convincing most Canadians that it's happening. Canada is already experiencing the effects of climate change. Here in the West, twice as many hectares of forests are burning every summer compared to the 1970s. And while we haven't had the craziest fire season this year in 2020, globally, it's the worst season ever. The fires in Siberia have been absolutely catastrophic. Here in Canada, we have already seen so many of our famous glaciers shrink or disappear entirely. This here is the Athabasca Glacier up in Jasper National Park, and it's already lost half of its volume since 1900. At this rate, it's projected to be gone entirely in 70 years. Touching back on Mike's story in the Hortzman Glacier, well, I was one of those kids in the photo that would travel up there for summer training since I was 13 years old all the way up until last year. And with that iconic T-bar being removed, the opportunity for skiers and snowboarders to engage in summer training close to home has nearly disappeared entirely. One in a hundred year weather events are happening every few years. Whether it's a flood, a drought, a superstorm, we're starting to see this seriously in Canada. If you're from the Ottawa area, you definitely know that in 2017 and 2019, they had two one in a hundred year floods. Arctic ice is also melting faster than ever before. And sadly, this July, Canada's last fully intact ice shelf collapsed into the ocean permafrost collapse. Now, 
We often think of permafrost collapse as trees sort of just imploding in on themselves up in the high Arctic and releasing a bunch of methane. But we're starting to see it in the mountains in southern Canada as well. This is Joffrey Peak near my home in Whistler, BC. Last year in spring 2019, on a particularly warm day, the entire north side of the mountain collapsed on itself. Now when scientists analyzed the mountain afterward, they think that the most likely cause is the permafrost melting inside the mountain. The glue that held the mountain together gave way and the mountain came down. Now as someone who spends a ton of time in the mountains, this is pretty terrifying. Something has to be done, but what? Well, if you're like me, you probably think when it comes to a huge problem like climate change that the government is going to be the one to fix it. And back in 2015, I felt some hope as all the nations of the world came together in Paris, France and signed the Paris Agreement. They were going to bring down greenhouse gas emissions as a giant collective. Well, that all sounded good, but unfortunately, since 2015, greenhouse gas emissions have only gone up. Now here's a look at Canada's CO2 emissions from the past. We're going to start at 1990 and you see the greenhouse gas emissions kind of rising up. Now if the government took no action at all, our trajectory would have followed the red line. But the government did take some action. BC put in a carbon tax, a bunch of other industry regulations went in place, and the blue line is where we went. But the problem is, according to the guidelines in the Paris Agreement, we're supposed to be way down there at 611 megatons. So we've got a long way to go, and we need to do it quick. We need solutions, because guess what? It's time to get serious. When it comes to solutions, there's three main pillars that we've got to explore. The first is technological innovations. Engineers are discovering new methods to generate energy, as well as developing better electric cars, and also the world's first all-electric commercial aircraft, which took flight in Vancouver this past December. They've even figured out ways to take some of the excess CO2 in the atmosphere and bring it back in the ground. Innovations are fun and exciting, but they can also be messy, and mistakes are sure to be made along the way. The important thing here is that we stay persistent and keep our minds open to these renewable opportunities. Kind of like my husband's cooking. The first time he tries a new recipe, total flop. But by the third or fourth time, he eventually gets it right. The switch to renewables doesn't just make climate sense, it's also a smart business decision. And if there's one thing I love just as much as saving our climate, it's saving money. Wind is essentially a free source of energy that could satisfy the world's electricity needs 40 times over. And in terms of careers, a wind turbine service technician has been forecasted as the fastest growing job in the U.S. over the next four years. Now that's something to think about as you graduate high school. Hey Mike. Yep. Do you know what a wind turbine's favorite color is? No. It's blue. <laughs> Another free source of energy comes from our sun, and with the price of solar cells dropping 99% in the last four decades, it's even becoming cheaper than coal and natural gas in some markets. The second pillar is social and policy innovation. Basically, what we want to do is make it easier and cheaper to do the good stuff and more expensive and difficult to do the bad stuff. Things like carbon pricing. Carbon pricing has been proven to be the quickest way for countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And then of course you want to incentivize the good behavior. Things like making electric cars cheaper. And then there's social movements. Things like cutting down on the amount of meat you eat and going more vegetarian. If we all do that, it can make a huge change. Of course we want to reduce to zero waste and recycle and compost. Now if Canada is going to make this green transition, it is going to take a ton of work. And that's going to create a whole bunch of jobs, which is also a good thing. The third pillar is leadership and action. And we all have a voice, and it's becoming more important than ever to speak up for what we believe in. As a generation wanting change, the greatest strength lies in our numbers. Of course, there are gonna be some haters along the way. Heck, even I know some, but this is bigger than that. And this is why Greta Thunberg is the perfect example of how much influence a single person can have in the world. In just a few months, Greta's School Strikes for Climate inspired a global movement. In September 2019, over 7 million people marched for climate change. 
I even had the opportunity to take part in one of these Fridays for Future Climate Marches in Vancouver last summer. And it was the most incredible mass movement I've ever been part of. What inspired me the most was seeing how many kids your age were out there marching in support of climate change. Which brings us to this. Never doubt that a group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. If not us, then who? It's bad enough that my parents' generation threw it on us, but the last thing we want to do is throw it onto you guys. And climate solutions are global solutions. Climate change magnifies the weaknesses in our society. Look at things like wildlife and extinctions. That's being led by habitat loss. Poorer nations are less able to adapt to climate change, which helps compound racism and inequality, which leads to a downturn in health and well-being. And let's face it, if we don't have enough land that's arable that we can grow crops on, that leads to hunger. I had a first-hand look at how what we do over here on this side of the world can affect people on the other side of the world. Last January, when I made a trip to the Marshall Islands in the Pacific Ocean. The Marshall Islands are located halfway between Hawaii and Australia, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. They've been inhabited for over 3,000 years and currently about 60,000 people live there. I got to spend a day with a group of high school students on my visit and learned that they're, well, pretty much just like high school kids in Canada. When you see the Marshall Islands from the air, it looks like a tropical paradise. But when you look closer, you see a country facing enormous environmental challenges. The trouble started in the 1940s when the US government chose part of the country to carry out tests of its nuclear weapons. By 1958, 67 nukes were detonated, making a large section of the country uninhabitable. With a small population, limited resources, and a remote location, it's not a wealthy country. But the internet works just fine there, and unsurprisingly, the people want many of the same things Canadians have. Fair enough, I think. Cheap goods and single-use plastics flood in from overseas like they do in much of the world. But the problem is, they have nowhere to put their waste. Their garbage dump is the highest point in the entire country and is overflowing into the sea. Sadly, nearly every beach on the island of Majuro looks like this. Foreign fishing fleets have largely stripped the surrounding ocean clean of fish. One of my taxi drivers said he spent most of his life as a fisherman, but now there are not enough fish to make a living, so he drives a taxi instead. The highest natural point on the islands is two meters above sea level. While I was only there for a week, I experienced one of the ever more frequent sunny day flooding events. The high tide caused damage throughout the islands and is already a serious threat to their infrastructure. I have never visited anywhere that faces such an urgent threat from climate change. Through no fault of their own, if we use the current projections for sea level rise, this entire country will likely be gone in less than 50 years. It just doesn't seem fair. This Frankie to this, Rita to this, Chien to this, Riga to this, Chenji. Nice, I think I got everybody. Yeah. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. So all of this stuff can feel a little bit heavy, and you might be wondering, well, what can I actually do about it? Well, we're here for you. We've created our top eight things that you can do starting today. Here's number eight, something that we're well aware of. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Of course, we want to prioritize reducing the amount of stuff that we are bringing back into our homes. Things like single-use plastic or unnecessarily wrapped produce. For me personally, I make sure I bring my water bottle everywhere I go and that I always have my reusable bags every time I hit the grocery store. Number seven, turn down the heat. If you drop the heat in your house by one degree, it's not a big deal. But if 35 million Canadians do that, that is a big deal. So little actions can lead to big change. Number six is move cleaner. Walk, run, or ride your bike places. And if you need a lift, try carpooling or taking public transit. Basically anything to reduce the number of cars on the road. With COVID-19, I feel like we have all been doing a great job at vacationing closer to home. So let's just do more of that and experience this incredible backyard that we have here in Canada. Number five, buy only what you need. 
We all need to consume less stuff, and I'm guilty of that as well. Also, vote with your dollars. There's a lot of companies out there doing good things. Make sure you support those companies. Repair things instead of replacing them. We live in kind of a disposable society, but I think if we all made a bit of a more of an effort, we could change that. And finally, let's just get rid of single-use plastics already. Number four is eat your veggies. Now, we're not asking you guys to be full-on vegetarians, and if you are already, that's great. But for those who aren't, just consider adding a little bit more fruits, veggies, and grains to your diet in place of meat. In lead up to the 2018 Olympic Games, my husband and I began this challenge to see if we could become weekday vegetarians. And what started out as something cool to try has turned into an entire lifestyle change. I can confidently say that we're about 85 to 90% good most of the time. And when we do eat meat, we try and shop from our local farmers and vendors. Number three, join a group. We've talked about it here today. It's important to do things as an individual, but as a group, we have way more power. Find a group you identify with and get involved. Number two is to vote. We are so fortunate to live in a country that values the voice of its citizens. And from the time we were 18, we have the power to decide who runs our nation and what we want to stand for. In the last federal election, it was identified that people 18 to 38 had the greatest voting power. That's you and I. So let's take advantage of this incredible opportunity that we have. And the number one thing that you can do is speak up. Use your voice. Talk to your friends and family about these issues. Get involved with a group. Get out there and march in Fridays for Future. Let people know that you care. Write a letter, send an email, make a phone call to your MP, to your mayor, to a counselor in your town. Let them know that this is a big issue and you want to see some action. It is the most important single thing that we can do. We need you. So join us. Head on over to protectourwinters.ca to sign up to become a member and also to learn more information about climate change. And follow us on our social media handles. We probably spend most of the time on Instagram, so look for us at Protect Our Winters Canada. Tag us. Let us know what you're doing. Well, thanks so much, guys, for tuning in. We appreciate your enthusiasm as climate activists, and we'll see you in the great outdoors. <laughs>